Welcome to Wealthion. I'm Wealthion founder Adam Taggart, welcoming you back for another weekly market recap featuring Lance Roberts. Hey, Lance, how you doing, buddy? Well, I kind of feel like I should maybe have my helmet on and we're like we're in a bunker. So it's kind of been this whole week, right? It's just been kind of trying to avoid the uh, the headlines so much. All right. Well, maybe we can put two beer cozies on each side of that helmet and, and uh, help you recover from what I know has been a pretty rough couple yeah. of weeks, given all the volatility in the markets. So, uh, I mean, I guess let's let's dive right in. Right. Well, yeah. first, let, let's start with the uh, the uh, theme of the week. What, what, what are you going to pick? Uh, well, it's got to be oil and commodities. That's uh, that's kind of been the driver of headlines all week long, uh, whether it's wheat or oil or commodities in general. I think that's kind of on everybody's kind of front radar right now. And so we can kind of talk a little bit about what that means uh, in the short term and why you might be a little bit late to that trade if you're trying to chase it right now. OK, well, look, um, when one of the world's top commodity suppliers uh, goes to war and gets you know, trade cut off by the rest of the world, it's obviously going to have ripple effects. And we're seeing that happen in key commodity prices right now, yeah. oil, wheat, number of minerals, et cetera. Um, so I think that's you know, largely part of the cause here. But why don't you first recap for folks exactly what's happened with prices this week? Because some of them have just gone bananas, right? So whenever you disrupt supply, and that's the big concern here, of course, with what's happening with sanctions with Russia, and the problem now for investors is they're kind of waking up a little late to this and going, oh, look, uh, you know, I want to buy wheat now. Look at oil. It's at 110. It must be going to $300 a barrel now. The problem for now is that most of these commodities are so extended above the long term means that we're now to the point that they're about to start drastically cutting into economic activity. So the problem with high prices of commodities is they are a cure for high prices. And I know that seems a little counterintuitive. But this is all about supply and demand of these products. Now, currently, there is a crimp in the supply because of the sanctions on Russia. But Shell Oil today just wound up buying a tanker of oil from Russia for $28 below spot. Now that they've cleared that pathway, everybody else in the world is going to start buying oil from Russia at a discount to spot. That's going to bring supply back online. So the point is, is that when there is a solution to any of these issues with Russia, all these prices will immediately start to correct. So if you're long these commodities, great time to take some profits. If you're thinking about buying them here, do so, but with extremely tight risk controls. All right, and, and there's a, an element uh, in the commodities markets where you know there's, there's the physical commodities themselves that get bought and sold and shipped around the world. But then there's a massive paper market that's layered on top of that, right? Where right. people are just basically taking bets all day long about what's going to happen with the price of these commodities. And the paper markets can get vastly larger than the under the market representing the underlying physical commodities themselves. And uh, you know, speculators can really kind of whip these markets into a frenzy in times of of high uncertainty and high fluidity, like we're seeing right now, correct? That's right. That, that's right. So um, there's a thing called the Commitment of Traders Report, and this is a this is a data set you can buy if you want to do the analysis yourself. But it's a report that's put out, and there's basically three categories of people that buy options. There are the commercial traders. Um, these are people. I'm the guy growing the corn, right? So I have a bushel of corn, and I want to lock in these high prices. So I'm going to go out to the options market, and I'm going to buy calls or whatever it is, to lock in my price for future delivery. So that's one side of the market. The other side of the market is non-commercial traders and hedgers. And this is your banks, your hedge funds, et cetera. And these are the guys that are driving the price of the commodity more so than anybody else. This is all that speculation in the market. Then you have your small traders, which are your retails. But it's these large commercial hedgers and these large commercial speculators that are driving the price of oil. It's not really, you know, we talk about oil it's like, oh, it's supply and demand. It's really not. It really is the speculation in these markets that oil prices are gonna go higher because of this. So they wind up driving the price of oil higher through their actions. Great, okay. And, and I just wanted to make sure we put that on the table because as you say, 
uh, people see these fast rising prices and begin to feel like, oh my gosh, I'm getting left behind. You know, if you're going to jump in and go long things like oil or gas or wheat or some of these other commodities right now, um, it, it, it may still be a good time. But as you said, they're already kind of stretched at these like four, three, four, five times standard deviations. That's right. um, and that's probably, you know, the, the speculators are probably playing, you know, a material role in that. And I'm just underscoring this because what tends to happen is, is when resolution comes and resolution could come with a ceasefire, resolution could come just with lower demand or resolution could come with more supply coming online, like you just mentioned with oil, you know, those prices can, can contract and sometimes they can contract pretty quickly. And so, you know, again, what I'm just trying to underscore here is you know, want to try to minimize people kind of jumping in because of FOMO on mm-hmm. these things and then being the last guy to buy in right before things contract. Well, and that's a, that's a great point here too, because in in the commodities market, prices move a whole lot faster than happens in the stock market. So when these options close out and unwind, they unwind very rapidly. So you know, just like you saw oil prices going up, when we get a resolution of any type, oil prices are going to fall ten and fifteen dollars in a minute. And as these things unwind, that will feed on itself. If you go back and look at a chart of commodity prices. They're not gentle unwinds. They're very, very fast when they fall. All right, and, and just giving people a sense of, of how fast and far some of these prices are moving. Um, wheat's going off the charts, and I, I don't know off the top of my head what that is. Um, I know that European natural gas price is the highest they've ever been. Um, mm-hmm. I'll try to find a recent chart of that because it just shows you how ridiculous the current <laughs> spike is. But even just oil, when we were talking last week, last week's weekly market recap, Oil was in the low 90s. It's now trading at $115 mm-hmm. a barrel. Right. All right. So um, where I kind of want to go with this next is I, I put out a tweet uh, a couple hours ago, um, just trying to raise people's awareness. Um, we now have much higher <laughs> base commodity prices. And we're just talking about how they, they may start moderating at some point, but they may not. Or even if they do, they may settle at a much higher baseline than when they were, say, six months ago or so. Right. Yeah. So that makes the cost of doing everything more expensive, right? Because the base inputs have become more expensive. Mm-hmm. Um, you pair that potentially with credit becoming more expensive. And that is a recipe for a disaster. You know, the economic, the, the world economic system uh, has already been slowing pretty dramatically on its own since the major you know, stimulus packages have been turned off. And if we're now entering a future with higher base input costs and the Fed raising rates and the world just increasing the cost of, of lending in general because of increased uncertainty, like what's happening with Russia, right? Cutting Russia off from the SWIFT system is creating a cascade throughout the system that is raising the cost of overnight borrowing. So um, I just want to get your, your thoughts on this, Lance. You know, if we have higher base input costs that persist and we have increasing credit costs, is that just like a recipe for crisis in the future? Well, well, let me answer it this way. Let's, let's, let's roll the tape backwards here just a second. So at the end of December, we're all sitting around going, oh my gosh, we've got 7.5% inflation. So the Fed's going to have to tighten monetary policy. Okay, great. Why does the Fed tighten monetary? What does hiking rates have to do with inflation? Right. What is what is, what's the connection between those two? Well, if I increase interest rates and particularly in a heavily indebted economy like we have now, that means the cost of borrowing goes up, the cost of doing business goes up, the cost of lending goes up, et cetera. And what that does is that slows the rate of activity within the economy because the borrowing cost of money has now gone up. So the reason that I hike interest rates is to slow economic activity. If I slow economic activity, I know this is this is kind of very base economics, but if I slow economic activity, that's demand. So if I slow demand in the economy, that means prices start to come down as the supply builds up. Business owners are going, man, I've got to get rid of this excess supply I've got because my demand all of a sudden went away. So they start selling things at discounted prices to get it moved out the door. So prices come down. That's disinflation. Um, and if they go negative on a price basis, that's deflation. But that's how that's the whole purpose of raising interest rates. Now, 
Let's couple that, or actually, let's just set this, the Fed aside for a second. How's another way that we, can, that we can solve the inflation equation without the Fed hiking rates? Well, that's high prices. If high prices go up enough, and again, let's think about for a second, you know, we, we throw these things around. We talk about wheat and oil and all those things. Let's talk about the consumer impact of this, because if I go to the gas station, and again, this is, this is always interesting about retail sales. We get the retail sales report. And we go, oh, look, retail sales were up 1.3% last month or whatever the number was. Well, that's measured in dollars, right? So if you go to the, the gas station at the corner, right, and fill up your gas tank, we measure that purchase in dollars. So you spent $40 at the gas pump to fill up your, to fill up your tank or whatever you spent. So we measure that in dollars. So last month it was $30 to fill up your tank and this month it's $40. So retail sales went up 10% on, that, on, that, on, on those numbers. But did you buy more gas? And the answer is no. You bought the same amount of gas. Your gas tank will only hold 14 gallons, 16 gallons, whatever it is. And most likely, if you're like me, I drive the same route every week back and forth to work and I fill up once a week. It's just, it's, it's, it's almost guaranteed that I'm going to put the, almost the same amount of gas in my car every week because my route is very set. So if that's the case, I didn't buy any more product. I bought no more volume. I just paid more for it, which means I have now less discretionary income to spend at home. So as prices go up on food and energy and these other things, that means I have less discretionary income to buy other stuff with, which means that demand falls, which means that now if you take a look at retail inventories, this is a great example of supply build. We had a supply problem earlier in 2020 and 2021 because we shut down the economy. Nobody could produce anything. Now retailers are going, man, I have all this backlog demand and they're producing stuff like crazy. And we now have a big retail inventory buildup. So now that we've got this retail inventory buildup, now demand is going to slow because of high prices and retailers go, now I've got to get rid of this excess supply. I've got to bring prices down. This is why, this is why the evolution of inflation is always inflation leads to deflation, deflation leads to inflation. It's always a cycle because you go through these economic capacities of too much supply, too little demand, too much demand, too little supply back and forth. And that's what's going to happen here. So High prices and commodities are a tightening of monetary policy. Now we're going to put on top of that, the Fed's going to hike rates, tighten monetary policy even more. And you've already got the economy, according to the land of Fed, GDP in quarter one of this year is currently slated to come in at zero. John Belushi's GPA in Animal House. <laughs> so <laughs> zero point zero. Mr. Zero. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. So we've got John Belushi's GPA coming in for GDP in the first quarter. And it's, it's probably going to get worse by the time we get to the, to the end of the quarter. But, you know, this is already the dynamic we're dealing with. The economy is slowing down. Now you've got less liquidity, no more checks to households, no more unemployment benefits, no more extended unemployment benefits, and all that. It's all gone. Everybody's trying to live on their income. And if you looked at the payroll report that came out this morning, Huge job numbers, right? 600 and some odd thousand new jobs. Wages, John Belushi's GPA. <laughs> no growth in wages and 7.5% inflation. So you've just got monetary tightening everywhere you turn. And that just is telling you the economy is going to slow down. And if you don't believe me, just go look at the yield curve. The five-year, the five year, one-year yield curve is just a hair above, above zero, the 10-year, two-year yield curve is at like 25 basis points at this point. It's not going to take much to be at an inverted yield curve probably in the next three, four, five months. I don't think the Fed is able to hike rates more than once or twice before they're really in a tough spot. All right. That was a great explanation. And um, the key thing that I just wanted to sort of highlight by having it was, uh, you know, the risk of recession um, is material at this point. You know, I don't know if you or I necessarily want to say there's definitely going to be a recession later on this year, but we're definitely seeing an economic slowdown. And you know, there's there's nowhere to go below 0.0 .0 except in the <laughs> negative territory, right? Right. And and GDP negative GDP of two quarters in a row is is what qualifies as a recession. Um, so uh, that is the reason why I'm asking or raising all this is because that will have to be reflected at some point in stocks, right? I mean, stocks in theory, and we can argue whether this happens in practice that much anymore, but in theory, 
uh, stocks are, are priced off of their future earnings mm -hmm. flows, right? And so if we're expecting economic activity to slow, consumers to be pinched by, you know, tightening my, uh, monetary policy, et cetera, um, you know, you would expect profit margins to come down, right? So uh, are, you, are you becoming more concerned about the prospect for stock prices looking forward in the year? So it, it's an interesting question. Mike and Mike Leibowitz, uh, my partner um, and co-portfolio manager at RIA, we were having this conversation the other day. You strip out the top 10 stocks of the S&P, you've got a bear market. Um, you know, there's a lot of stuff. And this is a very, uh, this is a very interesting market that we're in right now. If you just look at the S&P index, we're down roughly about 10%. We closed this week right back above the January lows. Um, you know, and you'd say, well, yeah, hey, we're down 10%. Really not that big of a deal, right? You go underneath the surface. There are a litany of stocks at that are down 30, 40, 50, 60%. There are more lows on the NASDAQ right now, more 52-week lows than we've had at any other point in the last 30 years, right? So if you had that type of the number of stocks, you know, previously at 52-week lows, and I'm not talking about, you know, when I say the last 30 years, I'm not talking about a little bit. I'm talking about a lot. I mean, it's there's a big gap in the number of 52-week of lows that we've got going on right now versus other previous bear market bottoms that we've seen. So... You know, if you look at beyond that, the headline of the index is the Apple, the Microsoft, the Amazons, the Googles. There's a lot of devastation that's happening in the market. And, and this is going to be one of those kind of weird things that could potentially turn out is that we wind up kind of going through this market over the course of this year, lots of up and down. We wind up not really going much of anywhere and have this consolidated bear market that we wind up working off valuation excess. I'm not saying this is going to happen, but that's kind of what's happening right now. Um, as long as all this, and this is a function of passive indexing, by the way, this is, this is part of what we, this monster we've created inside the markets because of passive indexing. You got Apple that is in 363 some odd ETF. So every time somebody buys an ETF, it's just fueling Apple. Apple, in turn, is buying back, you know, shares as fast as they can. They've bought back half a trillion dollars worth of their shares. But that's also another thing that's supporting markets here. Why is it that some stocks are holding up much better than others? And you can drag that down really into corporate share buybacks. The companies that are getting decimated, the Asanas, the Snowflakes, the Palantirs, the, those type of stocks, they don't have the ability, they don't have the capital to buy back their shares. We now right now have a near record, and I mean, just we're off a record by just a smidge right now of corporate share buyback announcements. And we're going to set a record this year of corporate share buybacks. But those are all happening in these big large cap companies, the, the Apples, the Microsoft, the Googles, those type of companies. And those buybacks are providing an artificial bid below those stocks. So you know, it, it's a very interesting conundrum. And, and I've, you know, I've really put a lot of thought into this and, and I'm trying to figure this out. I don't have an answer for you, Adam, to your question. Everything in the playbook, historically speaking, now here's, here's the point of all this to, and to answer your question. Everything in the historical playbook says that when you have a combination of high commodities, high commodity prices, slowing economic growth and the Fed raising interest rates, you're going to have a bear market between 30 and 50%. That's what history says will happen every single time. Could this time be different? I'm not saying it is, but all I'm saying is, is that already with the kind of devastation that you've got going on below the surface, this market should be down 15, 20, 25% already, not 10. So, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a challenge if you're just looking at the index. And here's the point about this is if you're just looking at the index, you're really missing the real story. The real story probably is your portfolio. <laughs> and depending on how you're invested, and I can tell you this from the number of people that are emailing me their questions and portfolios and, and you know, asking me for help, is that they're invested in the companies that were running up in 2020 and 2021 where they thought they were geniuses because everything you bought went up. But they're in the American Airlines, they're in the Delta Airlines, they're in the meme stocks, they're in these, you know, uh, what we'll call the ARC stocks, and they're being absolutely shellacked in their portfolios. 
Now, if you're in an ETF portfolio, yeah, not too bad, right? You're down about eight, nine, 10% for the year, no big deal. It really depends on what you hold in your portfolios to really what it looks like um, in your reality of your investing world. All right. Now, this was great because you brought up like five different topics uh, in the same answer. Um, <laughs> and, 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 and real quickly, you know, diversification helps, right? So, you know, the people that are in an ETF versus a small number of, of shares, you know, they're invested in a lot more different companies. And so they're seeing less mm -hmm. portfolio volatility, right? Um, but there's so many other things I want to crack into here. So you did a great job of sort of explaining kind of what I'm going to call the lipstick on a pig factor that's going yeah. on in this market right now. <laughs> exactly. You look at the indices, they're down, but they're not down that bad, right? And so they don't look all that bad until you look under the hood and realize that it's the vast majority of companies are, are all in bear markets, right? But it's these few big players that are holding everything up, right? Um, you talked about buybacks. And I just got to ask you this question, Lance. I don't know if you have an answer for it, but... Buybacks used to be illegal, and I still have a really hard time looking at them and concluding that they are not uh, price manipulation. So uh, should they be allowed? No. So let, let's and so let me let's let's clear up a couple of myths here real quick because there's one in particular that just drives me absolutely insane. Share buybacks are a return of capital to shareholders. No, they're not. A dividend is a return of capital to shareholders because exactly. why? You get capital. If Apple buys back a share of their stock, and let's say that let's say that there's two shares outstanding, right? Apple owns one and you own one. And Apple says, I'm going to buy back a share of stock and they buy back the one they own. Did you get anything from that? transaction? Did you receive any cash for your shares? Did you receive a check of any sort? No, you didn't. You received nothing from that transaction. Yeah, it's a and, distribu distribution of your capital to other people. Correct. And who are these other people that are getting your capital? Now, the SEC did a study on share buybacks. Who were the number one beneficiaries of share buybacks? Corporate insiders. Corporate insiders, who, exactly who had stock options, employee stock option plans, stock grants, those type of things. So when the company announces share buybacks, the people that share buybacks enrich, the shareholders that are getting a return of capital are the insiders and executive C-suite officers of companies. And you're absolutely right. Um, from 1933 until 1990, stock buybacks were illegal because they were considered to be a form of stock price manipulation. And that's exactly what they are. And this is, this is a problem that now was created by Bill Clinton. So when Bill Clinton was in office, Bill Clinton had this great idea. And, and, and it was actually was a good idea at the time, he thought. He says, hey, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to cap executive compensation at a million dollars. So corporate CEOs, we're, you know, we've got this imbalance of equity between workers and CEOs. And Bill Clinton had this great idea. We're going to cap CEO pay at a million dollars. The problem was is that he didn't consult anybody on Wall Street. And Wall Street said, who cares? We'll just find other ways to compensate our executives. And, you know, there's plenty. There's CEOs out there right now. They take a dollar in salary, right? Their salary is nothing. Everything they get, they're making billions a year in, I shouldn't say billions, sorry. They're making millions and millions of dollars a year. And they are worth billions uh, because of stock option grants, you know, all these different things that they get in terms of stock option based compensation. This has led to another problem, and they interviewed CFOs of companies. The Wall Street Journal did this study and, and interviewed CFOs of companies. 40% of corporate earnings are fudged in order to meet Wall Street estimates. And guess what else happened with Wall Street once we went into this new paradigm of stock option-based compensation? Now, Adam may be too young for this, but I'm, <clears throat> I've been around this game for a long time. And used to be when companies announced earnings, it was all about generally accepted accounting principle earnings is what you made. And the accounting stood by that. Now, at the very back of the 10K, 10Q report were the pro forma operating earnings. And they said, well, if everything had gone the way we thought, this is what our earnings would have looked like. But what was reported to Wall Street was these gap earnings. 
Of course, we threw all that out the window and all we report on now is pro forma operating earnings because that's how companies beat their estimates every single quarter. Have you ever wondered why every single quarter there's an 80% beat rate in earnings by companies? Two reasons for that. One is the pro forma operating earnings. And the second thing is analysts starting at $5 in earnings. And by the time you get to the earnings reporting period, we're down to a dollar so they can beat it. Uh, you know, these are all the manipulations that go on in the markets. And we could spend a whole hour <laughs> talking on just these things. I've written several articles on our website, but here's a little stat for you just to take away. Since 2011, 40% of the increase in the, in the S&P 500 is directly attributable to stock buybacks. Without stock buybacks, the market would be trading around 2,500, not 4,300. Okay, great. So um, great answer on buybacks in general for the folks that, that you know, weren't as familiar with that topic beforehand. Yeah, it's you, one you of those did, things did that really pisses It sounds me like off. you and I are both in the same team, you know, the, the, the <laughs> anti-buyback team. Um, yeah. But to your point there, about 40% of, of market value increase uh, over whatever period, what period was that? 2011 to present, 10 years. Okay, okay. past 10 years has been through through buybacks. And I totally believe that. As the cost of capital gets more expensive, it's going to get harder and harder for more and more companies to finance their buybacks. Right now, the Apples, you know, who just have gargantuan cash troves, sure, they're still going to be able to do it. But you're going to see fewer and fewer companies that are going to be able to, to afford to do this. And a lot of companies with credit as cheap as it's been, were borrowing to finance those stock buybacks and really kind of hollowing out their balance sheets. And now they're at a point where maybe the piper's really going to need to be paid because they can't continue that gravy train because they get the debt's getting too expensive. Um, I know I'm kind of speculating here, but just curious on your reaction. No, to that. no, you're right, and it's not just buybacks that are important. Look, like I said earlier, um, the companies that are doing the buybacks, these are your big boys, right? These are the guys that can afford to you, you know, you know, Apple, 170 billion dollars in cash or whatever on their balance sheet, they can buy back shares. And yeah, they've been even though they have all this cash, they've been issuing debt to buy back shares, right? Because it's it's such low cost of capital to do it. Um, a lot of these smaller companies, small cap, mid cap companies, they don't have that kind of cash, and and they don't really have the the debt structure to be able to do that to buy back shares. They are issuing debt just to make interest payments on their debt, right? And this is what we call a zombie company. We have a record number of companies that are considered zombies right now in the small cap, it's Russell 2000, right? So there's a tremendous amount of risk that when higher borrowing costs come along, that we could potentially see a very sharp pickup in bankruptcy filings in the Russell 2000 index because of exactly the point you're talking about. I'm, I'm not saying this is gonna absolutely happen. I'm saying that's the risk that's sitting out there is there's a lot of companies that have been borrowing money just to pay bills, not to do stock buybacks, just to survive. And that's going to be a problem if for any reason uh, they get cut off from the cut from capital because of changes to monetary policy, weaker markets, weaker economy, et cetera. All right. Yeah. And so folks, when we talk about instability in the economic financial systems, these are a lot of the issues that we're talking about here, where I sort of use that term lipstick on a pig. There's a lot about the way in which uh, a big part of corporate America works that that's very much lipstick on a pig, where it all looks healthy, but you get a few things, you know, going against the status quo, and you can have a domino effect of a lot of these weaker players all of a sudden really start crashing. Um, all right. Well, the, the last point I want to make on this topic, and I'm, I'm sort of laughing in my head as we're talking so much on this here, Lance, because we were kind of talking before we turned the camera on that, like, oh, we're not really sure what we're going to talk about this week. Well, geez, <laughs> we, we, we had a rich vein here. Um, but is um, I, I see a really big risk as we have, you know, this I'm, just to make the math easy, I'm going to say 10 companies that are really propping up these major indices. If we start losing people from the bottom of that, that cohort, right, because they start falling out of the ability to keep on doing what they've been doing, we get into that issue of, of uh, being over-owned that you talked about earlier, where, um, you know, 90% of, of uh, the NASDAQ, you said, or 80, 90%, you know, it's like in a bear market, but it hasn't mattered so much because of the smaller companies, right? But as these big over-owned companies start stumbling, well, they're just as they're having an outsized impact and propping things up, they're going to have an outsized income and 
dragging things down once they start stumbling. I see you nodding here. Yeah, no, no, you're right. The question is, is what's going to bring Apple down, right? Um, what's going to bring Microsoft down? You know, these companies are also very overvalued uh, by many measures. Uh, what's going to bring NVIDIA down, et cetera? You know, those are the companies that are holding up the market right now. And look, NVIDIA stumbled. AMD has stumbled now. Facebook, Meta, whatever you want to call them, um, dead. Uh, they've stumbled lately. Um, you know, so it, the erosion is happening. It just hasn't gotten fully up those ladders of generals, which make up 33% of the market cap in the S&P 500. So what's going to cause it? You know, it's just a change of confidence. Look, bear markets are very simple. It's just a change of confidence between being bullish or being bearish. And remember, the market is just a big, giant organism. And this is why it's so important you know, not to let your, your personal biases affect your view of the markets because, you know, you can be very bearish, right? You can be sitting there going, I think the world's coming to an end and, you know, and, and we're all going to be living on the street and whatever. I need to be in, we said this last week, I need to have, you know, ammo, beanie weenies and, and spam. So, you know, that's okay to have that personal bias. The market doesn't agree with you, right? Your personal bias doesn't matter. Pay attention to what the market, the market's this big giant living organism. It's, it's millions and millions of minds that are all in there every day transacting. I'm willing to buy and sell at this price. That's what's go- That's the whole market. It's this giant living, breathing organism. What does technical analysis tell you? It doesn't t- give you any insight about what's going to happen. It tells you what the market is saying. It's telling you what all these millions of minds are doing at one time. Who's buying, who's selling at what price. That's what technical analysis tells you. Where were they buying before? Where are they likely to buy now? That's what's telling you. So your personal biases have no place in running your portfolio. Pay attention to what the market's doing because that's the organism you're dealing with. And, and this goes back to, to everything else we're talking about here is that you know all these type of other actions, those are all getting factored in. And, and, and whether it's stock buybacks or whether it's interest rates or Fed policy or whatever it is, the market is factoring those things in. We're going to get a rate hike in mid-March of a quarter basis point, looks like right now. And that's already been priced in. You know, this 10% decline was already front running the first Fed rate hike. Um, you know, despite the, the Russian invasion, the market really hasn't paid a whole lot of attention to that. It's just been pricing in these rate hikes. So we're going to get the first rate. Here's what's going to happen. We're going to get the first rate hike and the market's going to go up. And the media is going to tell you, oh, don't worry about it. See, markets don't mind rate hikes. In fact, historically, stocks always go up after the first rate hike. And that's a very true statement. They do. In fact, stocks tend to go up after the second rate hike or the third or the fourth. The problem is, is there's one rate hike too many, and that's where markets stop going up and they go down very rapidly. The problem is, is we don't know where that is, and neither does the market but it'll create some type of economic or credit related event that'll break something in the market. And then that's where the risk comes in. And so that's, you know, those are the things we got to pay attention to, but the market will tell us it's coming. We just got to pay attention to what the market's telling us. All right. Well, really well said. And, you know, uh, sentiment, which is what you said, really Mm -hmm. defines bull and bear markets. Um, It happens at the margin, right? Right. You're, you're, you're net bullish right up until the, the, you know, (laughs) the critical person turns bearish and then you're net bearish, right? right. So uh, perhaps uh, maybe one of these next uh, uh, recaps we do, we can really dive deeply into the importance of the marginal buyer. Cause I think that's something that a lot of people really don't fully understand, mm-hmm. um, but we don't have time for that today. So um, looking at the time here, let me get to uh, be remiss if I didn't ask you about uh, trades that you guys have been making over the past week. Yep. Um, let us know what you've done. I do want to give you a shout out though. Um, uh, the bonds that you were buying and the shorts that you were adding along the way mm-hmm. a couple of weeks ago, uh, they definitely had their moment in the sun there. I know that that things have been a little volatile since, but but there was a time last week where I think I sent you a text saying, "Hey, you know, kudos. I know you took a lot of <laughs> a lot of guff for buying those bonds, and all of a sudden you look like a genius." Yeah, well, that's always the case, right? I mean, even my clients were like, I don't understand why we're buying bonds. And it's like, well, as soon as that Russian invasion happened, they were up like 5% in two days and um, you know, took a lot of the, the sting out of the, the rest of the equity side of the portfolio. And that's the whole purpose of having a hedge. Hedge, you know, hedges don't work when markets are going up. That's why they're called a hedge. And but they're there 
like wearing a seatbelt in your car. You can certainly drive without a seatbelt, but the accidents are a whole lot worse, right? So, you know, the whole reason for having a hedge is that when something unexpected happens, those things tend to step up and buffer the portfolio against volatility. Now, just in, in, in you know, clear disclosure here, um, we were adding bonds a couple of weeks ago. And on this rally, we were buying them right around the lows. And on this rally, we sold those positions that we bought. Now, we still own a fairly sizable chunk of, of treasuries in our portfolio longer term. Um, but from a trading perspective, we did take some profits out of that. And, and if rates pull back here again, uh, back towards recent lows, then we'll probably reload that position. Um, one thing here too is that we also reduced our shortcut. We had a short position also that uh, in the midst of that Russian invasion, we we reduced that substantially. In fact, we sold almost the entirety of it. Um, the goal there was to get this rally kind of back to the kind of the the downtrend line from the January peak and and the and the two hundred day moving average. Those are intersecting right now. Uh, that was kind of our target. We were going to reload our short position. That we didn't quite get there. Um, that target's still in, in, in play. We're not overbought yet on the markets. We're still on a buy signal, but the last couple of days, the markets have been playing pretty weak. So probably early next week, we're probably going to reload that short in the portfolio as well. Um, but we've just been kind of trading around the edges. Um, we've already reduced our equity uh, exposure in our portfolio a good bet. Uh, back in January and February, we were selling off a lot of our technology stocks, reducing them. We didn't sell all of them. Uh, we don't ever sell all of everything unless something just doesn't you know, work out right. For instance, we had sold Netflix before earnings and then they collapsed and we had a small remaining position that we let go right after earnings. Um, so those things, you know, but we, we try to, to, to keep positions we like longer term, but we measure and monitor the amount of risk. So we've already been reducing exposure previous to this. So we've got, we're underweight equities, we're overweight cash. Um, we kind of reduced our hedges a little bit here. And if we get a little bit of a follow through rally next week, which the markets are still set up for that going into the Fed meeting, um, then we'll re probably reload our, our shorts and hedges and, and kind of protect ourselves. There, there's a couple of reasons we're a little bit underweight shorts and hedges right now. And that's because we've had two negative months of returns in a row. That is, is that in itself is... I shouldn't say a rarity is not a good term for that, but it doesn't happen real often that you have two consecutive, very negative months in a row. Um, so generally, you're going to get a bounce. Now, if we have three negative months in a row, that's just going to that's just going to increase the odds of having a bounce. But between March and April, the market is going to bounce, and because you have such extreme negative sentiment, because you do have equity put call ratios back down to uh, very negative levels, the National Association of Investment Managers, their allocation exposure is down to very negative levels. Um, we run a composite technical gauge, which is near the lows of where we were in 2020. There's a lot of, of what we call fuel, right? So if you think about the market like a car, and right now the, the gas tank is completely full. So all you need is any piece of good news. Something comes out of Russia or uh, the Federal Reserve backs off a little bit more, says something dovish, you're gonna get a very strong rally, three, four, 5% over the course of a couple of days. And it'll be a very sharp reflex of rally economy. We saw the, the day of the Russian invasion, right? <laughs> you saw this very strong counter trend rally you're likely going to get that. Um, and then that'll be the opportunity really to, to reset hedges and reset um, you know, bond positions. Because going out the rest of this year, I think the real key word here is still volatility. You know, I would almost be willing to bet you that we're going to wind up end of this year, not too far off of where we started this year. And I mean, just kind of, you know, we're going to go up and down a whole lot and not really go anywhere. So it's going to be a very challenging year. It's going to be a year where stock pickers are going to win over passive indexers. But that's the type of market I think we're going to be in for a while. Okay, great. I had like five questions and you answered about all of them in that answer, okay. which is great. Um, and I just want to underscore your prediction there. We'll call it a soft prediction, but that right. we may end the year flat, but it's not like we're going to take, we're going to be flat the whole year. <laughs> it sounds like you think we're going to have an off, yeah. awful lot of volatility there, which yeah to your point about active investing that we've talked about in previous uh, recap videos, um, those people are gonna do, they're gonna have a chance to make a fair amount of money. Mm -hmm. Whereas if you're set it and forget it, you know, hopefully you'll do okay if it's flat. And of course, if it's not, you know, 
we'll see what happens. Um, look, I, 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 I still have a bunch of questions that I'd love to go through, but we got to begin to wrap this up here. Sure. One question I've gotten a lot today, because um, we talked briefly about the Russian equities last time when they were kind of going on fire sale prices. Um, well, yesterday, most, I think all of the Western exchanges delisted those companies. Mm -hmm. And so the question is, is for, you know, gotten from people is, hey, does, does, does that mean if anybody invested in them, are, are, are they gone? Or will these stocks come potentially back on the exchanges at some point in time once things with Russia have calmed down a bit? That it's it's an I don't know answer. And, and what I mean by I, it's not that I personally don't know. Nobody knows. Right. Um, you know, there's two. It was interesting, too, because there was an article this afternoon that uh, Goldman Sachs, J.P. Morgan are out buying Russian equities. Right. Um, hey, so, have, sorry to interrupt you, but I sent it a tweet when I saw that news. How can those guys be allowed to buy <laughs> Russian credit when the retail investor can't <laughs> buy Russian equities and it's corporate right. credit and corporate equities? Right. So what do you think Wall Street's fair? I mean, <laughs> yeah, I guess so. I mean. Nobody cares what you do, <laughs> so, but it, no, it, you're right. No, it's not fair. Look, look, I have a, we can, you know, someday we'll have to sit down and say all the problems. Today's conversation is all the problems that are wrong with Wall Street. I don't think people should be allowed to trade before and after markets when the average retail person can't really have access to it. I mean, there's, there's a lot of things that need that if you wanted a fairer marketplace, you know, we should, there's some things we can do to fix that, but to, to the question here. Um, there's no guarantee that if you bought a Russian equity or a Russian ETF or whatever it is, or a Russian bond, in fact, uh, there was, a, I saw another article that retail investors on Reddit were lining up to buy Russian debt. Um, there's no guarantee that, A, those are going to get relisted anywhere um, anytime soon. Now, I, I, I certainly imagine that at some point down the road, there's going to get a relist done. But they may go through bankruptcy first. And, and what I mean by that is, is that we could see reorganizations in a lot of these companies, depending on what happens. And that means your shares of what if you own, just let's just pick a company kind of everybody knows. Let's talk about Luke Oil or Rosneft, right? So everybody knows those companies. Theoretically, and this is how it would work. And I'm not now, let me. Let me caveat here. I'm not saying that these companies are going bankrupt. So don't run out and say, Lance said they're going bankrupt. I'm not saying that. Example, okay? Just an example. But if, you know, if things get bad enough there, we could see these companies go through reorganization. They shaft all their current shareholders and say, sorry, your current shares are worth zero. Um, they bail out their debt uh, players and then they come out of bankruptcy and they're all nice and clean. They've got reduced debt and they issue out all new shares on the markets. And you're going, hey, I still own shares of Rosneft. No, you don't. You own the old shares. You don't own the new shares. So your value is zero. Um, this is the risk of speculating these markets. And I'm not saying that you shouldn't do it, um, you know, but you want to do it very carefully. Risk sizing is always important, right? Never invest more into this type of stuff than you're willing to lose. So you think about if you're going to go to Vegas, way to, the, the way to always measure your risk is if you went to Vegas to play blackjack, how much of your total net worth would you lay on the table for one hand? What not? I'm not talking about playing over the course of a day or two. What would you put on the table for one hand? And of your percentage total of your net worth in your portfolio, and whatever that answer is, 1%, 2%, 3%, 5%, that's your risk size. So because the odds are that you're, whenever you take, and this really goes for every position in your portfolio, if you bet on a speculative investment, you should always bank on it going to zero and measure your risk according to that risk. How much are you willing to lose? And then if it works out, great. That's wonderful, right? But if you lose it, you were already set up for it. Well, really wise advice. And I, I just want to point out here that, you know, I think there were some people over the past week or two, you know, who saw those shares getting decimated and, mm -hmm. and hopefully through very speculative money in there, you know, money they could afford to lose if the blackjack hand, you know, went against them. Um, and we'll find out. We're going to find out at some point, you know, how the story ends. Do they, do they get vindicated or do they, is that money all gone? I think it's interesting. I just saw uh, a notice yesterday that uh, the uh, Kentucky pension, state of Kentucky pension fund, uh, had an oversized position 
in some of these Russian companies that got marked down 90 plus percent, right, through all this as well. Yeah. So it's going to be interesting. So forgetting about the little speculators for a moment, there, I, I think we're going to begin to see a number of headlines over the next couple of weeks of funds that for one reason or another, whether they realized it or not, had much more exposure to Russia than they should have. And they have core positions that are all of a sudden getting vaporized here. I see yeah. a nodding. Yeah, no, you're absolutely right. There's there's a lot of exposure, not just in equity funds, but also debt funds as well, credit funds. So you're going to see a lot of hedge funds come out that potentially, you know, we could see some hedge funds blow up over this. Um, this is one of the things that we've talked about for quite a while now is that, look, if you were running a diversified portfolio and you bought the S&P 500 emerging markets and international markets back in 2009, you vastly underperformed just on the S&P 500. The emerging markets and international have done poorly over the last decade. And now, so even more, they're continuing to lag here as well. So there, you know, the, the risk right now is that there's a lot of infection. You know, this is, uh, Adam, I don't know if you remember this, but back in 1997, we had the Asian contagion. Absolutely. <laughs> and, and so this is the Russian contagion. And, you know, what I mean by that is, is that they're, they're infecting all these other asset classes that have exposure to them. And you may not even realize that you've got exposure. If you own a bunch of ETFs or mutual funds, you may not even realize that you've got exposure to these companies until you look at your statement at the end of the month, and then you're going to kind of realize it pretty quick. So, you know, this is one of the reasons we've been advocating be domestically based for the time being, you know, you know, hold treasuries over corporates for the time being, because those are the safety assets. That's where money rolls to in time of safety because they're highly liquid and this is where money hides. If I have nowhere else in the world to go, I go into the top 10 stocks of the S&P 500 and I buy treasuries. That's where I hide. And that's another reason why Apple and Microsoft and those companies are holding up better than others. All right. Well, Lance, well, I could pull threads like this with you all day long. We're going to have to wrap up here. Um, but really been enjoying this uh, series. I'm getting lots and lots of positive feedback from folks. Folks, if you want to give us feedback, positive, negative, constructive, whatever, please just do so in the co uh, comments section below. We'll read them. But Lance, we're going to have to leave it there. Uh, folks, if you, uh, you know, again, like this series, want to see more of it, please support this channel by hitting the like button and then clicking on the red subscribe button right below. Lance, thanks so much for another great week. I'll see you next week, buddy. See you then. Thank you. Thank you.